you are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta. Grant McCauley, Jake Mastriani with you after what was a night off for the Braves, unplanned, a doubleheader thrown into Wednesday's getaway day in Detroit, but you'll take the wins however you can get them. And the Braves won not once but twice. They swept the doubleheader. They were able to kind of wash the bad taste out of their mouth from the first game in which they very easily could have beaten the Tigers and swept the whole series. But we're going to leave the past in the past because we got a two for one here on the Braves postcast as the Braves took game one by a 10-7 score and held on for a 6-5 win in game two. As always, I'm Grant McCauley. He's Jake Mastriani. This is the Braves postcast, part of Lockdown Sports Atlanta. So make sure you're subscribed here on YouTube. Click the bell to get notified every time we drop a new episode and make sure you subscribe to Lockdown Braves wherever you get your podcast. Jake, we got a lot to get into on this edition of the show. And as I like to say, or have said many, many times, I don't know if it's caught on yet. I don't know if it's trending worldwide, but you can win ugly, but you can't lose pretty. And this series, these three games, might have really encapsulated the spirit of that saying. Yeah, I, I could not be more eager for them to get out of Detroit. This just we won the series, but it man, it it felt rough out there. It was not easy at all. These uh these Tigers were pretty scrappy. The Braves came out of there a little banged up and bruised, but overall they got they got the series win. Yeah, they did. And and I think it's worth saying, I know we mentioned it a little bit earlier on the first game of the series. I mean, the Tigers were kind of floating along, doing all right for themselves before they hit the skids on that nine game losing streak, which they broke at Atlanta's expense in that opener. But at that point, no matter what happened in that game, you knew the Braves needed to have a very short memory. They needed to come out and figure out a way to win not one, but two games to take this series. And they did that in Wednesday's doubleheader. Let's talk about game one. Uh, for the Braves, who had 10 hits, or excuse me, 10 runs on 11 hits, no errors, and four men left on base to pick up that win. Tigers, though, they fought back. They out-hit the Braves. Just seven runs, though, but 15 hits, a couple of errors, 11 men left on board uh, for the Tigers. They had some opportunities in this series and in this game, no question. Spencer Strider, he was on the receiving end of the Tigers' early barrage. He's 7-2 and two now on the year, but, man, it didn't really feel like it with this line. Five innings, seven hits, five earned runs, couple of walks, six strikeouts. How about three home runs for Spencer Strider? Again, he does pick up the win. Uh, Reese Olsen took the loss in this one, but let's go ahead and you know start talking about Spencer Strider a little bit here, Jake, because as we've gone along, uh, just about each and every one of Strider's starts, really since the calendar turned into the month of May, there was some good and some bad and, and maybe some in between. This one, though, probably going to be categorized under – ugliest start of the year coming off of what was prior to this against the Mets. Maybe that's his ugliest start of the year, but this is becoming a trend, I guess is what I'm saying. And that's something that Spencer Strider, I know, wants to figure out a way to reverse course very quickly on. Yeah, back-to-back starts that could be labeled as two of your worst starts of your career. That's not ideal, and that's where we are with Spencer Strider at the moment. Look, long-term, I have no worries about this guy figuring it out, but Let's be honest, he's in a rut right now, and he is, he is struggling, whether it's mechanically, uh, it doesn't seem to be physically, uh, but it's just he he's not there right now. He's not able to execute his pitches. You look at the three home runs he gave up today, one on a 97-mile-per-hour fastball middle of the plate, another one on a 96-mile-per-hour fastball down and into Miggy Cambrera, but yeah. he's still a Hall of Famer. He was sitting on it, and he got it, and he turned on it. He can do that, and then another 96-mile-per-hour fastball down the middle. I know there's a lot of talk about his – of velocity it you know average wise it's been where it has been pretty much all season but max velocity today 97.9 we're just not seeing a lot of those 98s 99s when he can usually go back and get it but still I mean it's, it's 96 it's not like he's throwing you know low 90s fastballs up there but I just I think it's more mechanical we talked about this after the last start too I just think when he is missing he's missing over the heart of the plate I think it's more control than command right now you even saw he had a couple of sliders get away from so yep. again I don't know what the fix is here but I know Spencer Strider knows himself more than anyone and I think he's going to figure it out but it has been a pretty rough like you said really month plus now for him where he just hasn't been that dominant type of Spencer Strider that we're used to seeing yeah, and there have been some starts in there that make you feel like, okay, well, there's a little bit of a bounce back effort. But clearly, coming off that Mets start, which again, just to kind of correct myself, I mean, that's the ugliest start of the year. That's the worst start of his career. This one against the Tigers, though, I mean, it felt every bit as frustrating, especially when he got jumped on early for those three home runs. You mentioned one in the first and then two in the second inning. So he found himself behind very quickly and probably kind of feeling like maybe he was on his heels a little bit, too, 
with the way the Pirates, or excuse me, the Tigers came out and kind of punched him in the early going. And, you know, as Mike Tyson would say, everybody's got to play until they get punched in the mouth. The Mets and now the Tigers have kind of come out and punched Spencer Strider very early and often, as the case may be, especially in that Mets game. So he does have to figure out a way to make some adjustments. And I'm sure he's not taking any solace in picking up the win. Maybe covering the five innings is something that he can take from it and say, okay, well, I had to find an answer. I had to find a way to at least get my team that, especially on a doubleheader day. But this was kind of a perilous start for Spencer Strider. No two ways about it and some adjustments to make. Now, unfortunately, we're going to get into the Braves' offense. There were some good things that happened, believe it or not, on a day that the Braves won twice. But something that got everybody's attention and everybody's heart is certainly uh, kind of maybe got into their throat a little bit was Jesse Chavez taking the line drive off the inside of the left knee off the bat of Miguel Cabrera when he came on in relief in game one of Spencer Strider. Chavez was carried off the field. He left very gingerly. It wasn't carted off, but was carried off by the training staff. And you know, that immediately made you worry. Maybe have flashbacks to Charlie Morton in the World Series in 2021 as well. Jesse was x-rayed and underwent some tests uh, at a local medical facility there. The x-rays were negative. I saw his comments after the game, said he was a little bit scared, obviously, for what it could be. And, and concerned and, and hated to you know get knocked out in a doubleheader where the bullpen may have really, really needed him. So the ultimate team guy, go figure, talking about being a team guy. But, uh, Jake, that's a pretty scary incident because you never want to see that happen to anybody, obviously. That's uh, just scary in and of itself. But Jesse's also been one of, if not the Braves' best reliever this year. So this was the kind of injury that came up at a very unforeseen and an unfortunate time for the Braves in this one. We talked about the other night with Marcelo Zuna getting hit and now Jesse Chavez getting hit. You know, who would have thought here we were being really worried about losing those two guys at this point, but they've both been so huge. We did get to see Marcel back, so that was great. And as you said, good news for Jesse Chavez after the game, but it looked bad. I mean, the fact that yeah. you know he's a competitor and he even said so, his first thought was get up and go get the ball. And when you saw he couldn't even get up off the ground to go get it, I mean, it immediately – had to make you think the worst that something was broke there. So for that not to be the case is certainly great news. And everybody loves Jesse Chavez. He's been getting pushed for all-star game. He's been so great this mm -hmm. year for the Braves. So glad to see that he's okay. Hopefully he won't be out very long. I'm sure it's going to take a while for that to, to heal up. I'm sure it doesn't feel great, but very scary moment there with Jesse Chavez going down. Yeah, hopefully just a few days to kind of let that swelling go down and just kind of an injury scare rather than a long stay on the injured list or anything of, of – of, of that magnitude and obviously the x-rays being negative that's a good first step they'll run some more tests as they get jesse back in town with the whole team coming back to take on the rockies in a four-game series beginning on thursday so uh, putting that aside and the start of spencer strider aside the braves offense showed up big time in this first game but nobody i don't think showed up more so than michael harris the second fifth home run of the year was part of a four for four day it included a double he knocked in four runs he scored three runs he stole a base Jake, this is kind of just building on what we felt like was coming, and that's the breakout, the breakthrough for Michael Harris after a slow start to the season. Yeah, one way to do that, have a bunch of three-hit games and a four-hit game. That's one way to just quickly boost your average up to 227 on the year. I mean, he was hitting a buck 80 not too long ago, a week ago. So it's been an incredible run for Michael Harris. Again, we've talked about it. Knew it was coming at some point. And here we are in the middle of it now, and it's just great to see. And it's really just, you know, helping this lineup go even more. I mean, you see, again, Acuna, three RBI in this game. I mean, you get on in front of him, and especially with the speed Harris has, you're going to score a ton of runs. He had a stolen base as well on the day. So, I mean, just doing great things, obviously, defensively all year long. But now you're getting that offense to go along with it as well and you know we talked about the fact that we needed to see him kind of shoot balls the other way and he's done that as well but you're also starting to see him you know pull the ball through the right side and find yep. some holes as well he wasn't getting any of those early in the year i mean some really batted bad batted ball luck but now he is you know pulling the ball with some authority as well starting to find some holes get on base i mean it's just going to make this offense even better yeah, a couple of more things before we start talking about Game 2 and, of course, get you set for Game 3 of the series. Ron Lacuna Jr., you brought him up. Get on in front of him. He'll knock in some runs. He had three RBI on the day. 14th home run, first of two in the doubleheader. Went three for five. Stole his 29th base as well. I'll go ahead and go full spoiler. He homered in both ends of this doubleheader. Hit his 15th a little bit later. Did get nabbed trying to steal a base in that second game, but I tweeted this out. You may have seen it. You may have already noticed if you just kind of looked at Ron Lacuna Jr.'s stats from a year ago. Jake, he's sitting on 15 homers and 29 steals as the Braves have played 68 games. It took him 119 games to get those totals last year. He has matched his output in both homers and steals. 
This is the Ronald Acuna Jr. Show. And I guess, as they say, we are all witness. It's 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 laughable now to look at the people last year who thought this is just who Ronald is and this is the player he's going to be. I know I never thought that. You never thought that. A lot of people in Braves country never thought that. And now we're all getting to sit back and say, this is the player that Ronald Acuna Jr. is and everybody's getting to enjoy it, or at least those in Braves country. But the home run he hit in game one was huge. You talk about coming off that loss on Monday and then you're – top starter gives up four in the blink of an eye and then ronald with that two run home run at that point you thought okay they're going to come back in this game that's where you started to feel like momentum shifts so big home run there for ronald as well to get him back in that game yeah big answer and you know that ron lacuna jr loves those moments he loves to come through i mean this guy he loves to play baseball and we're seeing it so much more so now that he is 100 percent healthy and doing things the likes of which maybe nobody in baseball has ever done the pace if you're wondering on the 40 40 counter 36 homers, 69 stolen bases is the pace that he's on. And we're pushing halfway through the season. So it's starting to become less of a, okay, that's fine. It's early. It's a small sample size. Now we're starting to look at, okay, it is a long season, but this guy is doing some pretty special stuff. And in fact, he is. I can confirm that. Mm -hmm. A couple of things we didn't want to see in game one, but we did. The bullpen made it a little bit interesting late. Rice Iglesias did not have fun in this series. Three more hits, another run allowed. He was able to shut the door. It wasn't a save situation, but things got really hairy there in the ninth inning before he's able to get out of it. Nick Anderson also got knocked around a little bit for a run on three hits. Both of those guys have kind of been taking their lumps lately, so starting to you know, maybe get a little bit concerned that it's not just as crisp as you'd like it to be in the back end of the bullpen. And I know a lot of people are like, okay, well, Anthopolis needs to get on the phone right now and go out and make trades. Now, let me tell you what does need to happen. In addition to maybe making a trade at some point, you got to get Iglesias and Nick Anderson going the same way you had to get A.J. Minter and Colin McHugh going. It's going to take everybody to get this bullpen turned around and get them where they want to be from a stability standpoint. Nick Anderson's been great all year. It's a good article on Fangraphs, so it's not good if you're a Braves fan, but they're talking about perhaps some regression coming there, and maybe you're seeing some of that. But either way, he's been fantastic for the Braves all season long. Iglesias is the one – you got to have right. I mean, he's your closer. You got to be able to count on him in that ninth inning. He, to me, you know, is the big ticket here. You got to make sure that he is that lockdown guy. But I got to give props to your guy, Kirby Yates, here as well, because he came in after the Chavez injury and came in there and had a, a one, two, three inning, 11 pitches, two strikeouts. I mean, that's huge to see. You know, some of these guys may regress in the terms of Nick Anderson. If that happens, you need a Joe Jimenez. You need a Kirby Yates, guys who were supposed to be your big setup guys. You need them to start stepping up, and we're seeing signs of that with really both of those guys, Yates and Jimenez, here lately. Yeah, very good call there. We saw some good stuff from Joe Jimenez, especially in game two. I thought he was going to get a chance to close things out and get the final six outs, as it turned out. A.J. Minter jumped in and helped out with that. Well, let's talk about game two a little bit after I let you know about one of our great sponsors because this edition of the Braves Postcast is brought to you by Game Time, which is the place for last-minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event with exclusive flash sales and deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, basically whatever you're looking for, Game Time might have it. And the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find the tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference on that. So snag those tickets without the stress with Game Time. Go on and download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code Locked On MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create that account, redeem the code Locked On MLB for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Let's talk a little bit about the second game of this doubleheader before we get you ready for the four game set against the Colorado Rockies. Braves with a 6-5 win, six runs, 10 hits, no errors, five men left aboard. Tigers, five runs, six hits, no errors, and four men left. Colin McHugh, maybe the most important outing that he has had this year to this point. Three innings he was able to bridge after Dylan Dodd uh, was unable to really give the Braves what they needed to get from him, uh, lasting just four innings and getting knocked around, but three perfect frames for McHugh, which set up five perfect innings for the Atlanta bullpen overall in game two. McHugh now 3-0. and Michael Lorenzen takes a loss. He's 2-4. and A.J. Mentor came on, uh, came on to get the final out and locked down his 10th save, but Joe Jimenez did some good heavy lifting for the Braves with an inning and two-thirds and picking up a strikeout as well. I uh, love to talk about the offense. Mention the Acuna home run is 15th of the year. Ozzy Albies also hit his 15th home run in this game. Eddie Rosario with another homer. He had two more hits. And Marcel Ozuna was back in the lineup. Those kind of the offensive highlights in a nutshell from the 30,000-foot view but I don't know, Jake, if we can really look too much beyond what the, the Braves bullpen, as battle-tested as it's had to have been in the series and the lumps they have taken, they got exactly what they needed from McHugh 
and from uh, Jimenez and from, of course, A.J. Minter briefly to close these things out. That was a huge performance by that trio. When the way this series has gone for the, them to hold the Tigers scoreless, and that sounds kind of funny to say because they were last in the league in OPS coming into this series, but to be able to hold them sc- scoreless after the fourth inning was really huge. I, I'm not going to lie. When Rosario hit that home run, I said, good, they're up by one. They're going to need more. Yeah. But that wasn't the case because this bullpen came in, settled things down, and, I mean, shut it down the rest of the way. And Colin McHugh, who – you know, his his overall ERA may look good this year, but his stuff hasn't been great near where it was last season. But he's starting to come around as well and was really awesome today. 18 whiffs on 14 swing, swings against that sweeper of his 39% whiff rate on the day over those three innings, just 81.4 mile per hour average exit velocity against him. I mean, you can't say enough about what that guy did today. And we mentioned Joe Jimenez needing other guys in the bullpen to step up. He did a great job, and then Minter coming in to finish it off. So, yeah, big shout-out to the bullpen in the game, too, to really settle things down and allow that one-run lead to hold up. Yeah, and Dylan Dodd was the 27th man brought up as the doubleheader rules allow for, and he did not have to use an option in order for the Braves to do that either. That's why he got the start in game two. A lot of people were wondering, why not A.J. smith Shaver? It was his day. Well, the Braves would have had a hole later this weekend against the Rockies where they would have had to call somebody up by Sunday and they would have had to use an option for somebody. So it made a lot of sense to use Don on full rest. He looked okay the first couple of times through, or at least the first time through the order, but then he ran into a four-run Tigers fourth inning, and that's when the ball really started flying for him. And Detroit took that 5-4, to four, or excuse me, tied the game up 5-5, five, five, I should say, uh, with that four-run frame. And then the Eddie Rosario home run in the sixth was all the runs that were scored by either side for the rest of the way. But I'm with you. I kind of felt like the way this series had been going – Maybe a one-run lead wasn't going to be enough to stand up because the Tigers, credit to them, they just did not go away, but the Braves' bullpen was able to hold them down with the final five innings. Yeah, they were. Like I said, it was huge, and just to get the series win and get the doubleheader sweep, you know, it's always tough to win a doubleheader, and especially you're expecting and hoping that your starter in game one and Strider can give you some more innings, but unfortunately was only able to get through five and really felt like they were lucky to get that. So uh, really huge for the bullpen to step up, McHugh to cover three of those innings so you don't have to go deeper into it, and the offense just to get those timely hits and get just enough runs. I mean, again, it felt like the series went a lot worse in Detroit than it did, but at the end of the day, they get a series win, they get two wins on Wednesday, and now get to come back home. Yeah, it doesn't matter how you win. It's just important that you win. The Braves were, you know, very close to a sweep of this series. But as Jake mentioned, it kind of felt like the exact opposite. It was very frustrating. It was very, you know, edge of your seat, maybe a little more anxiety than you would have expected from a team on a nine-game losing streak. But, hey, I mean, that's baseball. You've got the Oakland Athletics doing some crazy stuff these days as well, winning against a team that you wouldn't have expected them to do too much winning against, which is the best team in baseball, the Tampa Bay Rays. But that's another story for another podcast or another time. Altogether, Acuna one for three, the 15th home run of the year for him, scored a couple of runs uh, and also drew two walks. Ozzy Albies two for four with his home run. Eddie Rosario two for three with a homer. He walked three times on the day, did Rosario. So he has appeared to enjoy hitting in Detroit over the course of his career. And it came in handy with the clutch go ahead home run that he hit in game two of the series. As again, the Braves picked up that six five win and the doubleheader sweep, which brings us to Thursday, which is when the Braves and the Colorado Rockies will open up their four-game weekend series. A.J. smith Shaver is going to be on the mound for Atlanta, making his second major league start. He has yet to allow an earned run in his young career. He'll be going up against the veteran lefty, Kyle Freeland, who is 4-7 and seven with a 391 ERA on the season. Just looking for more of the same, I think, from A.J. smith Shaver, who certainly navigated a lineup pretty well in his first full start at Truist Park last time out. Can't wait to see him pitch again. Like you said, I mean, he did a good job in his first big league start, so can't wait to see how he follows that up and what adjustments that he makes because I still think, as I said, after that start, I think there's room for him to be even better, and I think there's a lot of potential there. I think very highly of him, so I can't wait to see how he follows that up, and hopefully the Braves can bring that same energy they had on the last homestand, which wasn't all too long ago, uh, and keep their winning ways going. Yeah, a little bit of an odd you know, six-game homestand, three-game road trip, four more games at home, but they didn't have to travel too far, just running up to Detroit and coming back, though it may feel like they've been through a war by the time they do come back to Truist Park for this four-game set. Colorado last place in the National League West, though they are winners of three in a row, just 29 and 40 on the season. It will be interesting to see our first look at the Colorado Club. Well, that wraps us up here on this edition of the Braves Postcast, a two-for-one and two wins on the same day on a Wednesday 
which truly was just that for the Atlanta Braves. Make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta here on YouTube. Click the bell to get notified. Go ahead, click that like button. And if you have enjoyed the show, make sure you tell a friend we appreciate that. And make sure you subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, it was a two for day for the Braves as far as wins. 10-7 in game one and 6-5 in game two to win two out of three in the series in Detroit. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. We will catch you this weekend as the Braves battle the Rockies. And until then, so long, everyone.